Oh, my eyes are water. But uh, yeah, the main thing is we both have gotten negative results. It takes nine hours to get to Bosnia, to, Sa to Sarajevo. So the bus we're on is kind of like a, a large transit van. Isn't it? Yeah, it's actually comfy enough. It's yeah, nice. It's not yeah. like a big coach that we've been kind of. We were lucky the last time, but this isn't yeah. so bad because we've been on worse mini buses, so. Yeah, true. You know, this is actually this okay. This one holds maybe about 25 people, maybe. There's nobody on it just yet. I don't think it so, will be too full either. No, although there is, what we've been finding as well is that when we leave, say, the depot, there's X amount of people on it, but then we stop three or four times on and the way and then more people yeah. kind of get on and get off and stuff like that. So it's kind of, we have a seat each. I don't know if you can tell we can put our bags there. Uh, but that's not always the case. If people get on, then we might have to double up. Okay, so we are now at the Bosnian border. They've taken our passports. We're not entirely sure if we have to get off the bus or not. On some of the borders, we've had to uh, get off and they go through your, your luggage and stuff. But I'm just looking there now. It doesn't. There's only two of us on this bus, by the way, me and Samantha. So maybe that will be a deciding factor. I don't know. They might just, you know, let us stay on the bus and they might just drive through. The Serbian police officer got on when we were leaving Serbia and just took our passports and our. Our negative test form and went into an office and then came back out uh, but now we are after leaving serbia we're entering bosnia so the bus driver has our passports and he's at a little window and uh yeah we just have to wait and see what the story is okay so we're through the border country number five okay so we are through the border samantha was saying country number five and um, yeah we didn't have to get off um, or go through our luggage or anything. They just came on, took our passports. We didn't have to move from our from our seat. They opened the boot, had a little look in the uh, in the boot for the suitcases. There's only two of them. There's only me and Samantha there. And uh, yeah, he just kind of waved us on, and that was it. So that was as border crossings go. That was pretty easy, to be honest. But we are pulled in now, so we do not have the bus to ourselves anymore, Samantha. I think there's some people getting on. Yep. Yeah. But I think we've only got two hours to Sarajevo, so. Okay, so we're off the bus now. It's five past seven. It took about eight hours, so yeah, it was a long bus journey. We are here now at the bus station, and we just have to try and get a taxi now, because I think our hotel is about 15 minutes away. Good morning from Sarajevo in Bosnia. So we are just outside our hotel here and um, the name of the hotel is Hotel Herc. It's uh, a really good deal we got on it. It was 22 euros a night. That was with a breakfast included and it's literally a three minute walk down to the main city center. So it's a perfect location. Okay, so we've just had our coffees. It is freezing today. This is the coldest day we've had since we, since we started this trip. It is minus one. It is Baltic, there's actually bits of frost and it is expected to snow in a couple of days we'll be gone by then but uh yeah it would have been nice to to be here for the snow wouldn't oh it? yeah <laughs> Okay, yeah, so when we did our research on Sarajevo, there was there was three main points of interest. Okay, number one is probably uh, the war that took place here in the 1990s, um, especially in Sarajevo uh, between 1992 and 1995. 
Uh, secondly, the fact that uh, Sarajevo hosted the Winter Olympics in 1984, um, which I believe was the first communist state to actually host the games. And, uh, and thirdly, Sarajevo is actually the place where the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, who was the heir to the Austrian and Hungarian uh, Empire, uh, that took place here, which um, many people believe actually sparked World War One. So, um, so that'll be pretty interesting as well. So beside our hotel is the City Hall. Um, it is seen as a symbol of Sarajevo. It was built during the Austrian-Hungarian rule, but during the war in the 90s, uh, this building was actually set on fire. It destroyed pretty much everything inside, including all documents and books. And the aim of this was to basically get rid of all Bosnian history. In fact, a lot of the buildings that were reconstructed after the Balkan War, uh, a lot of funding actually came from Austria, Hungary, and, uh, and Turkey as well. I don't think it's open, but we can try to get in. Closed. Huh. So yeah, basically it just says on, on the side of the building here, uh, in the night of the 25th, 26th of August, 1992, was set on fire uh, by Serbian criminals. Um, and it just says, Bosnia has been over two million of the books and documents vanished in the flames. Do not forget, remember and warn. This is the... Okay, so I have another interesting fact about the City Hall. So when the Austrians and the Hungarians wanted to build the City Hall, the site was actually occupied by locals. So basically, they offered to pay all the locals. They said, like, we'll give you money, go and buy a house somewhere else, because they wanted the land. So they all agreed on it, by this one guy who uh, was a little bit stubborn about it, but he would only agree on it if they would literally move his house brick by brick across the river. And they did, and this is the house here now, right behind me. So it's actually a restaurant today, and the meaning behind the name of the restaurant is House of a Stubborn Man. Yeah, so Sarajevo was kind of heavily influenced by uh, two occupiers or kind of two time periods. Firstly, the Ottoman ruling, um, so you have a lot of Turkish influence here. And the old town of uh, Sarajevo kind of represents that. Kind of have like an old-fashioned market with like small buildings, small shops, and then you've got mosques kind of patched all around the town. Okay, so we're at an area here where there's just thousands and thousands of pigeons. <laughs> it's like a little pile-up going on there. So yeah, you can basically buy some seeds and then hold them out in your hands, and they all come over and land on you. But I think we're a bit afraid to do it. <laughs> Okay, so we have um, stumbled into hello into a a market which I think is um, Iran. This stuff is from Iran. Uh, also, another interesting point right here behind me. This is an old um, an old Ottoman style building, and it used to be a hotel. So back in the day, when a lot of uh, tradesmen would come into the village or into the town of Sarajevo, they would need to stay overnight, and this is where they would stay. <laughs> Also as well, um, I heard that you would also get free accommodation because it's a, I think it's an Islam tradition to give three nights free accommodation as, as a guest basically. But then after that, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I don't know what it is about the, the Ottoman style markets and streets and stuff, but they're just really like old fashioned and like... Quirky and I don't cool. know, they're really quirky and cool, yeah, to walk around, aren't they? Yeah, Do you get yeah. that as well? Yeah, there? big time, yeah. Okay, so we're just after coming out of the old Ottoman market there. There was a lot of cool things to buy, but unfortunately, when you're traveling, um, you don't do much shopping. Okay, yeah, so behind me here, you can see a um, fairly large mosque, but uh, they just had the, the call to prayer there, so um, it's full of people praying, so we can't obviously go in. But yeah, um, in this kind of Ottoman style market or village or old town, um, yeah, you do see quite a few mosques around. 
which is pretty interesting. So yeah, one thing that they're definitely not short of in um, in Sarajevo is little coffee shops, and they're kind of quirky looking they're kind of they're not very wide they're very narrow and long and they've kind of got really small seats they're <laughs> so really gonna, different but like really really cozy yeah they are cozy coffee. yeah so uh, yeah we're gonna go find one and um you know have another coffee break stop off for a coffee break Ah, thank you. Okay, so now as we leave the um, the old-fashioned kind of Turkish Ottoman style market, we are heading to what I said earlier was the second kind of time period or, or ruling was the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and straight away you can see the difference. The buildings are a lot bigger. This um, kind of tries to resemble like a mini Vienna which was the style or the, the, the plan when the, uh, the Austrian-Hungarians took over. Uh, and there's actually one interesting point here, I'll bring you back. Okay, so this little mark here on the ground is a separation between the old town and the new town. Okay, so in this part, um, you can see that it's a lot more modern. The buildings are much bigger and there's a lot more mainstream shops. Okay, so we are now here at the Sacred Heart Cathedral, which I think is the largest cathedral in Bosnia. So this here is a statue of Pope John Paul II who visited Sarajevo. So what's interesting about his visit is tourism increased after he came here. Because many people felt that if it was safe for the Pope to visit, it would be safe for tourists to visit. So another nickname for Sarajevo is like Little Jerusalem, I think they call it. And that's because there's a lot of diversity. You've got uh, the Catholics living here, you've got Muslims, you've got the Jewish, you've got the Orthodox, and they all live in the same area. So you have your Catholic churches, your Orthodox church, your mosques, your synagogues, and they're all in the one area, which is pretty interesting. The lads playing chess here. Do you know what I think is strange about the lads playing chess is that it doesn't matter what day of the week, what time of the day, <laughs> There's about 30 or 40 of them all, all playing. Just there. They must stay there all day. Like. They must have nothing to do. Okay, so I said earlier on in the vlog there was another point of interest and that was the assassination of Franz Ferdinand and the, uh, the spot in which it happened. So we're heading to that now. Okay, so if you're unfamiliar with the situation with uh, Franz Ferdinand being killed, it's a little bit of a sort of a JFK situation where you've got uh, a very important person, you've got crowds of people, you have uh, an open car, and uh, and yeah, what happened was you had six uh, assassins that day, and they were kind of planted around the uh, the city, you know, just waiting for their opportunity to uh, to kill him because they didn't really agree with. Uh, the occupancy of the Austrian and Hungarians here. What's kind of more interesting about the uh, assassination attempt is they firstly kind of made a botched job of it. They threw a, a grenade, uh, and missed the car, and then that kind of obviously warned Franz Ferdinand um, and you know the people with him that they would stay in the city hall and that it wasn't safe uh, to come back down onto the streets. And then as time passed, they actually left the city hall and this is crazy but the driver supposedly took a wrong turn there was a bit of a misunderstanding and they ended up literally outside a coffee shop where one of the assassins was kind of hiding out so it's a bit of a sit and duck situation he obviously looked out the window he seen the car pulled in with franz ferdinand and his wife sophia in it and saw his opportunity obviously walked outside and shot both of them they actually caught the six uh, assassins that day but the fella who killed Franz Ferdinand and his and his wife Sophia actually was just put in prison because he was too young to be uh, to be executed. Later on, he died in prison. I think maybe two or three years into his sentence of uh, of TB. But the rest of them who were above the age of 20 were all hung uh, and, and executed basically. 
and then many people believe that this kind of sparked uh, World War One, which is pretty interesting when you think about it. We're just walking up to the uh, to the actual spot where it happened. So yeah, let's check it out. Okay, from this place on the 28th of June, 1914, um, whatever his name is, I'm not too <laughs> sure how to pronounce it, assassinated the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Franz Ferdinand and his wife, Sophia. And it happened right here? Right here. I think that is a museum inside, but it's closed. But supposedly they actually have the original car. Oh yeah? They were in inside, yeah. Okay, I'm not sure if you can see this, but these are the men, these lads here. And this is them being arrested. That's them in court. I'm not too sure which one of the six it is, but yeah, some of them were killed, uh, executed, and then some were too young, and they were just put in prison. So here is basically the road that runs up and down. The river is on the other side. So the car would have been just coming up and down here, and that's where the first bomb was thrown. And uh, obviously then they sped up, and then the city hall, which is where we were earlier, is, is up this way. And then over here is the street where the car pulled in, where the bit of the misunderstanding happened. And then the guy was in this building here, ran out, and then caught them right in the middle of the street and shot them. So Sarajevo is actually a really, really pretty city. Um, it's surrounded by mountains, and then you have this big river here behind me, and this runs right up through the city. Um, I think it's called the Majaka River, if I'm saying that right. Okay, so we're in a nice little park here, and in the background you can see um, the buildings that are marked from the siege of Sarajevo from the 1990s. I think that went on from 1992 to the end of 1995. That whole time period is very interesting, but it's also very, very complicated. Um, I'm kind of learning more about it as we go. And I'll, I'll do my best to explain uh, what I can. Yugoslavia was basically one country consisting of Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, Macedonia, Montenegro. But the issues kind of started to arise when uh, the breakup of Yugoslavia happened. And then these countries all began to get their independence. This caused uh, an, an awful lot of issues at the time. Some of them were religious, uh, others it was like ethnic issues as well. And then in 1992, when Bosnia got their independence, they had a referendum. Now in Bosnia, you have um, the Bosniaks, which is the, the Bosnian Muslims. You have the Croats, but then you also have the Bosnian Serbs. And when the referendum happened, the Bosniaks and the Croats all voted for it. So they wanted their independence. However, the Bosnian Serbs kind of boycotted the whole thing and they weren't too happy um, about Bosnia getting their independence. Um, that was in 1992 and I believe the very next day, was when the war started and again i don't know everything really about it i just kind of uh, have done some research and kind of spoke to some locals in belgrade actually because we did come from serbia and uh, here in sarajevo so just trying to pick up information as much as i can uh, again you know it's just it's a complicated situation it's very very sensitive so uh, but yeah you, you can't escape it especially in sarajevo it's just the, the effects of it are everywhere Okay, so we are on our way now to a food market and um, I'll explain why in just a second. Okay, so basically that spot that we were just at in there um, was an explosion that happened in the market uh, back during the war in the 90s. So basically an explosion hit that spot and I think over 65 people were killed. But what's interesting is in an act of defiance they basically they opened the market and ran it as normal the very next day. So those little patches are basically spread around the city and they are known as the Sarajevo Rose and it's basically like a silent reminder to the people of the, the innocent people that were killed during the war. Okay, so here's another one right here. Okay, so we've noticed all over the streets there's a like little stall selling pomegranate juice. So yeah, we're gonna stop off and try one. Small. Yeah, it's quite, yeah. Yeah, a cup. A smaller. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect, yeah. What, what's your name? Merima. Merima. Ah. Hi, 
nice. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you <laughs> as well. And thank you for pronouncing my name. No you know? problem. <laughs> uh, no, people usually say Marama. Marama means scarf in my language. Scarf. I'm not scarf. Oh. Okay. Marima. <laughs> <laughs> um, may I compliment you? I really, really like your style, like your eyes, I mean, oh. I can't decide what I like more. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is our very own pomegranate from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm out of Laya. flyers, ah. I'm sorry. Ah. But what you see here is how it looks like when it's cut. Of oh, course, okay. this is standing in the water, so you know. Oh, lovely. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's popular over here, isn't it? We've seen a couple absolutely, of them. Absolutely, absolutely. It's very, um, very old. My boss has a plantage in Chapkina near Stolz. So, you know, it's quite nice. Ah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Taste Enjoy test. Now. Here's change. Thank you. Oh, wow, it's lovely. Is it? Yeah, it's really nice. Absolutely. I hope you will promote me. Yeah. <laughs> and Dubai so we will come there like we see you in Dubai and ah. like, I really do they say that <laughs> tell thousand words that didn't even leave, leave no. see me you know yeah need to go yeah I'm yeah sorry, I'm sorry, you're famous so <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Bye, 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 bye 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 okay so if you are in Sarajevo right there metropolis that is the place to eat. If you follow us on Instagram, you would have seen us posting pictures of our meals uh, on our stories. Uh, but yeah, Metropolis is definitely the best restaurant in town. It's kind of on the main street here. You can't really miss it. So, uh, so yeah, if you're in Sarajevo, go check it out. Okay, yeah, so if you can see, above me there, you'll see loads of um, kind of little Bosnian flags. And what's interesting about the Bosnian flag is it's, uh, it's blue and yellow, it has three points and they represent the Bosniaks, the Croats and the Serbs but uh, what's even more interesting about the flag is they didn't actually, they couldn't decide on, on a flag so they were given one by the United Nations and the reason for that was because the Olympics were coming up they didn't have a flag and they said look you need one for the games so yeah it was given to them and talking to a few locals about it they kind of laugh at it because you know they think you know if they walk through the opening ceremony of the olympics they just have a pole <laughs> so yeah but they don't really have much connection to the flag because you know they didn't create one themselves it was it was given to them so yeah so that's the story behind the flag okay so another cool thing to do here in sarajevo is the cable car and thankfully it's open Okay, so we just bought our tickets there. They were 40 mark for the two, which was 10 euro each. And um, we are under a bit of time pressure because the last cable car down is five o'clock. I think it's like three now, so we've two hours anyway to check it all out. Do yours? Yeah. Go ahead. Our second cable car to go on in the Balkans. I know, yeah. The carts are a lot bigger than they were in uh, Tirana. In Tirana were kind of small, weren't they? Let's go. Okay, so we're in the cable car now and uh, we are on the way up to the mountain. There's supposed to be some really cool views looking right over the city. And they also have the uh, bobsleigh or part of the bobsleigh track that Keelan was talking about earlier from the Winter Olympics in 1984, I think, was it Keelan? Uh, yeah. Yeah, in 1984. Oh, yeah. So yeah, it should be really interesting. God, the higher we go up, you can actually see it a bit of frost, can't you? Yeah, look at that. It looks nice. It looks nice and white. I'll tell you one thing: they are flying along them uh, cars, aren't they? Tirana took for ages to go. And it's not as long. I think we're nearly at the top now, so it's not as long as the one in Tirana. But I suppose that was the biggest one in like the, the one in, Yeah, the one in Tirana took oh, what was it, fifteen or twenty minutes to get from the bottom right up to the top. So, but the speed we're going at will be up there in a minute or two. I'd say. You hate this bit, don't you, Galen? I hate this bit. <laughs> it sort of rocks a bit. The thing shakes. Watch, feel it. Ready? And that's because of it. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look at all the frost. God, look at the houses and all that. Look, Andy. Oh, my God, look at the mountains. Wow. Okay, so we've arrived up here on the mountain now and oh my god, it is absolutely beautiful up here. The air and all is so fresh. Um, but we are on our way now to check out the abandoned bobsleigh track.
seriously, like just check out these views. We are like so high up. We're literally in the clouds and you can just see Sarajevo then uh, in the distance. As you can see now, we are here on the abandoned bobsleigh track. Okay, so even though it is abandoned, um, it's very impressive. It's dressed up with all this uh, cool graffiti. 